about today's topic, time management in the digital age, I think this is one of the biggest challenges in the 21st century. Now, time management already has always been a challenge, but it's a particular challenge nowadays for a number of reasons. Well, number one is work has no clear stopping point. So it used to be, if you were plowing fields, once you've plowed the field, you've finished. But here, it could be you're doing a PowerPoint presentation. You can always add additional slides or additional scenarios in your Excel spreadsheet. Similarly, work can be done anywhere. So we think that the idea of remote working is, is freeing. It frees us from having to be physically present in the office. But a consequence is it means that we're always mentally present in the office, even during evenings and weekends. A third is that email is, is really uh, convenient. It means that we can uh, send, send information and receive information. But it also means that we can be contacted by almost anybody, even if we're not the relevant person to address his or her question. And finally, there's almost limitless distractions from things such as email, meaning that it's very difficult just to take breaks or to focus on what's truly important. So here is a, um, um, a framework that I learned from, I think it was a book called Getting Things Done by David Allen about uh, filing away um, tasks. So what he suggests is that when emails come in, you should file them away into subfolders, which are called maybe today or this week. So if I had an email which was urgent, I needed to write reply to that by the end of the day, I would file it into the subfolder called today. So why do I want to do that? Well, you might think, well, why don't I just keep it in my inbox and um, then just reply to that at the end of the day when I finish the book chapter? Well, the problem is that when it's in your inbox, it just distracts your attention. You are always seeing it in your inbox every time you go to Outlook, and you always have in the back of your mind, I need to make sure that I reply to it today. So if you put it into the Today subfolder, it's out of sight, it's out of mind, and because you know it's in your Today folder, you know that you are going to get it done on that day because you're going to come back to it. And so then what I might do is that at 3 p.m., or it might change, maybe it might be 2 p.m. if I know that I've got lots of things in my Today folder, I will go to that folder, maybe even if I haven't finished the book, and then start going through all of the things that I need to do by the end of the day. Because it's in that folder, I'm not going to forget about it, I start clearing that out later on. And you can experiment with this and have variations. You can have a This Week folder, Maybe some of you work in really um, high-stress uh, careers where you can't even wait until the end of the day. But you could have a subfolder called This Morning, where you start going through that at 10.30 a.m. And that will still buy you 9 to 10.30, a good 90 minutes of work. Right? How often do we get 90 minutes to focus on one thing? Quite rarely. But you can focus on that for 90 minutes before getting to the this morning folder. Now, the one tip that I would say, if you were to implement this, is to be very stringent upon what you would put in your today folder versus the this week folder. So the today folder should have things which absolutely need to be done today. I would sometimes have wishful thinking. I would put some urgent things due today, and then other things which I didn't need to do until the end of the week, but I hoped I would do today. And so when I went to the Today folder at 3 p.m. or whatever, I'd realize I don't actually need to do all of them. So I do the uh, truly urgent stuff, but keep some stuff in the Today folder because I was tired and actually I didn't need to do it by the end of the day. But that's a really bad habit because this only works if you get into the habit of always knowing that you need to clear the Today folder at the end of each day. So the better thing is if there is something which isn't that urgent, Put it in the this week folder. If you're lucky, if you've started clearing out, you've emptied the today subfolder, start with the this week thing, but don't put things in today unless they actually need to be done on that day. Now, out of everything I'm going to tell you today, perhaps this next little bullet point is the one thing which gives you the most bang for buck in terms of how many emails that will save you. That is um, emails which uh, come from mailing lists. Now, I'm subscribed to a lot of mailing lists that I want to be subscribed to. 
They might be the Financial Times or um, The Economist, or they might be from shopping websites that I, I buy regularly from. Now, the thing about all of those emails is they do not need a response. When it's The Economist, I'm sort of just reading it and being receptive. And they're often all about the same thing. So if I was to look at my Economist or FT emails, it's probably going to be about Brexit, Brexit, Brexit at the end of today. So all of those emails, because they're from mailing lists, they have the word unsubscribe in them. Now, I don't want to unsubscribe. I want to receive those emails. But what I can do is I can go to Outlook. I can go to File, Manage Rules and Alerts to move any message with the word unsubscribe into a subfolder, which I call mailing lists, and it marks it as red. So what is great about that is it saves probably about 50 emails in my inbox. By the end of the day, I've probably got about 50 there. And it never even needs to go into my inbox, so I never need to spend time filing it away. It automatically gets dumped into that folder. And then at the end of the day, even if I'm really tired, let's say I've, I've gone out for a work dinner, I can go through those emails really quickly because none of them really need a reply and many of them are about the same thing. If they're particular like news um, emails, they're all covering the same news. So that saves lots and lots of time because I can batch process 50 emails, maybe in five minutes. And that's a general point, which is in the, the final bullet points here, the idea of batch processing email. So when I first got a BlackBerry, I loved to receive email. And so I used to have uh, the, the, vib um, the vibration uh, that I would get every time I got a new email. So it'd be I work on something, a new email comes in, I'd reply to the email because I was clinging onto my sticky rice of being known to be responsive. Then I go back to my work, Another email comes in, reply to that, go back to work. But there are studies quoted in the transcript showing that when you do that, you lose a lot of time switching from task to task. Because when you switch gears back, you've forgotten where you were, the flow that you're in, and so that's very unproductive. So instead, a much better approach is to work offline and batch process email. So what do I mean by this? Well, if I'm working and if I'm using my computer, for example, I might completely close my Outlook and then work on the book chapter and then after a certain period of time, then go back to all my emails. And maybe then 20 emails have accumulated, but I can go through all those 20 emails in one go. That's much better than interrupting myself 20 individual times. And that's particularly powerful when I use an internet blocker. So I use a program called Freedom, which blocks the internet for a pre-specified period. So let's say 25 minutes to be conservative. So why is it good to do that? You might think, well, why don't I just um, block the internet and not check my email until I finish this task? Well, sometimes the task might be open-ended. It might, it might take you one and a half hours to write your covering letter for a job application. And the human mind can't focus for one and a half hours or often. Whereas if there is a finite end period, let's say 25 minutes, um, you can focus for that time. Let me use an analogy. So for example, let's say your personal trainer asks you to do a plank. Hopefully she won't ask you to do it for 25 minutes, that would be quite cruel. But let's say she asks you to do it for, for, for one minute. Now, after 50 seconds, you're probably really feeling it, but you know that there's the end point, and you can probably last those final 10 seconds. Whereas if she said, hold a plank until I tell you to stop, that is open-ended, and you're probably going to give up much earlier than you would do. And so the analogy here is, let's say I've set the um, freedom to block the internet for 25 minutes, maybe after... 20 minutes, I'm sort of getting antsy. I want my distraction. I want to check the email. I want to check the football scores or whatever. But I know that in five minutes' time, I'm going to be able to have that distraction. So I will work for those additional five minutes. There's a clear endpoint, and that makes me much more focused uh, during that time. And what is really interesting is actually when I put on the freedom blocker, and when I click go, Actually, mentally, my mind just feels lighter. 
no, it's strange, but I think it's because I know that I'm going to have the next 25 minutes without any external pressure, without needing to reply to anything, and that's why just physically something changes in my mind when I do this, and so I think this is something which is really powerful. Okay, so that was dealing with email on your computer, uh, but what about mobile devices, which I think is, is, is really um, important. And so this is the idea of a mindfulness, which again might um, think, uh, w which sometimes is get, get, uh, has some misperceptions. It's something which is actually scientifically um, studied, which is the idea that if you are always distracting yourself, always needing to check email, then your brain actually rewires itself that you cannot focus. Go back to the plank analogy. If you are able to hold a plank, your muscles actually form, your muscles get stronger, so that you're able to hold a plank for longer. And similarly, if you are able to concentrate, your mental, quote, muscles change so that you are able to focus for longer and not be distracted. So when you teach yourself to go these periods of time without any distraction, that curbs your distraction for email and you get less addicted to it, you're able to focus. And why you use the addiction analogy is actually checking email is often like gambling. So why do I say that? Well, most emails suck, right? Most emails might be an email from your boss asking you to do work. There's stuff which asks you to do things, and that's why you like to reply to an email, because an email is a task which you have to do something. However, you still like checking email, because even though 90% of emails impose a burden on you, they tell you to do something, you long for that email, which might be from a friend who you've not been in contact with for a while. Or maybe it's from a headhunter giving you the opportunity to move to a different company. And it's for those lottery-like things. That's why we always want to check email. When the buzz goes off, we want to see whether we've won the lottery. And so that's why one of the solutions to this is to try to just wean ourselves off it. And one of the solutions I suggested is just to block the internet so that we are not trying to win the lottery is that this was just such a habit to me to check email at all occasions that I was numb to it. It could be, as I mentioned, I'd be on a restaurant meal, and if the conversation just got boring or just a topic I wasn't so interested in, I would just get out my email and check it. It would be that in an elevator, if it took sort of 10 seconds to go up um, to the fourth floor, I would get out my phone and start checking my email. And I think I was being really productive. That is great time management. I'm using those 10 seconds to kill a couple of emails. And I am saving those 10 seconds. But what I was doing to my brain in terms of creating my craving for distraction was actually far worse than those 10 seconds. It meant that when I was sitting down and actually trying to do some work, I was not able to focus. So what is the solution that I ended up coming up with? So I actually ended up taking email completely off my phone. I do not have my email at all. Now you might think, well, that seems really crazy and really bad time management. Because aren't there so many times where like, let's say I'm on a, I'm on a tube, where I could be just checking my email and, and saving myself time later? Well, what I do have is I do have an iPad. And on my iPad, I still have email. So why is it good to have email on the iPad? That now allows me to still save time. If I've got time between meetings or if I've got time um, on the tube, I can still kill those emails. But it stops the mindless checking. I cannot suddenly whip out my iPad in a restaurant meal. That would be really rude. And I can't suddenly whip out my iPad uh, when I'm going up the elevator. So it only means that I'm actually getting up and checking up the email when I've got um, serious time that I can actually compose some replies to it. And so this is part of a general idea, which I call a reverse pilot. So what is a pilot? A pilot is if you try something new for the first time, and you see if it works, and if it works, you can continue with it. Now, the reverse pilot is the opposite. Let's stop, do some, stop doing something. And if you stop doing something, and there's no negative consequences, keep stopping doing it. 
So I thought, well, if I take her email off my phone, I'm going to be just much less responsive and people are going to be angry with me. And I'm at, maybe I'm going to have so many emails left at the end of the day because I've not checked them in the elevator. But I actually realized, well, there's no negative consequences of that. And similarly, what else I, I removed? I removed LinkedIn and I removed Twitter. Those are things which have good business purposes. I will advertise my Gresham lectures on LinkedIn and Twitter. But I realized that I was also wasting a lot of time on them. So here's the final thing I'm going to mention. So some of you will have heard of Dan Ariely, who's a great behavioral economist. He's written books like Predictably Irrational and given great TED Talks. And we were both speaking at a conference in behavioral economics a couple of years ago, and he talked about how he was doing an experiment to encourage people to save in um, Kenya. And he ran this experiment. He does field experiments. And there were three things that he offered as interventions. Number one was at the end of the year, uh, at the end of the uh, month, he would boost your savings by 20%. Number two is he would send emails, sorry, he'd send text messages signed by the person's children to remind them to save. It might be, dear mummy or dear daddy, please make sure that you save this week so that I can go to college. Signed, the name of the kids. The third was he gave you a coin and you, at the end of the day, you had to scratch either yes or no according to whether you'd saved or not. So he asked us, which of those three methodologies did we think was most effective? And most people thought one or two. Right, the economists thought 20%, um, that's a, a huge incentive. The ones with a heart would have thought that the emails from the, chil the text from the children would have the effect. But actually, the answer was number three. And the idea here is that things are really different when you keep score. That's why things such as Fitbits and tracking 10,000 steps, people, that affects people's behavior. Even though there's no financial consequences of it, you're the only person who sees your steps. And similarly, if you're to be running on a treadmill or rowing on the rowing machine, you're going to be working much harder if you can see the distance than if you couldn't. So what he suggests is for some of these things to instill good habits is the idea of keeping score. So I have on my bedroom wall a um, chart where at the end of each day, I need to write down how many times I've picked up my phone and for how long I've spent on screen time. That's immediately recorded with the Apple Screen Time app. There's other apps like Moment which can do this. And that does change my behavior, right? It sort of makes me stop and, and decide not to take up my phone mindlessly because I know that if I do, I'm going to have to write down a really bad number at the end in the same way that people with a Fitbit might think, well, let me do these extra steps so I can hit my 10,000 target. These might think, thinking, um, seem small things, but people act differently when you're keeping score. 